afternoon. I'm Kevin Wallace. I am the president and partner of campaigncouncil.org and of course jo joined by um, one of our other partners, Carlin Sholsky, who is also a, um, she's the vice president with the company. And she is in beautiful Missoula, Montana today, and I am in delightful but somewhat windy um, southern Arizona presenting to you. And um, I know that most of you all are up in, the, up in the Omaha, Nebraska area, so we're thrilled to spend a little bit of time with you and chat about uh, our company experience and how we can kind of pass some of the things that we know about capital campaign planning and management along to you. Uh, beyond myself in Arizona, Carlin in Montana, we've got another staff member in New Mexico and another one in um, in Virginia. And we're a very specialized firm. We do capital campaign planning and management, and that's pretty much it. So we've done a whole bunch of work with nonprofits across the country. We were just talking to Abby, and it seems like right now <clears throat> uh, about two thirds of our clients are actually uh, east of the Mississippi and uh, every genre that you can think of uh, from a food bank that's raising $2 million to a Salvation Army poor that's raising $20 million or higher. Uh, and we are extremely blessed to have that large a variety of clients because it gets us to know all the different amazing and wonderful things that nonprofits are doing throughout the country to uh, improve the lives of individuals and or animals and or um, conserving nature. So thank you so much for being here. Learning objectives for today. So hopefully at the end of our hour together, you will be able to um, know how to develop a quantifiable benefit for your project, how to verbalize that and kind of analyze that. Determine if you need a feasibility study, which is on that campaign planning side of things, and then also to decide if you uh, if you ultimately need to hire a consultant to help you uh, to help you do all of that. So let me hand it over to Carlin, who is going to look jump into our agenda real quick. Or no, I'm sorry, plan. Sorry, Carlin, and I'm gonna That's okay. I'm gonna turn my mic off, folks. I'm I'm uh, I'm in kind of rural southern Arizona. I don't. I don't particularly trust my internet when I'm streaming my video the whole time, but I'll turn it back on towards the end. Thank you. Um, so before we get diving into the topics for today, this question that I have for you is what's your plan? And so if we're going to shape the context of this, it's like if you've ever tried to do a dance, but maybe don't know the choreography, you're like in the middle of a flax mob and you don't know what you're supposed to be doing. Or maybe you're learning a new sport and you don't quite know all of the rules. No matter how many football games I watch, I feel like every time I still am learning some new intricate rules. So if you don't have a plan, it's really hard to be successful, um, whether that's rules or questions that you need to make sure you're following. So in the light of that topic, we've positioned these six questions that we really recommend you ask yourself when you're thinking about if you're ready to start a capital campaign. So that's going to be our guiding agenda for today is these six questions. The first of which is, is there a quantifiable benefit to expanding or improving your infrastructure? The second one is if your board supports the project. Third, we ask, are your project costs current and realistic? two things that must both be there. And then you also need to determine if you need to do a professional feasibility study with an outside consultant. And if you do, if you know which kind of firm you want to hire in order for them to execute that for you. And then the last question is, when do we start? So Kevin's going to dig into number one, we're guarding the benefit to the project. I wanted to go back to that flash mob thing, Carlin, but you and I will talk more about that later on. Okay. I didn't, I didn't know that was something that you were doing. And I think that's so cool. I... It's a bucket list item. We can make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, quantifiable benefit. Um, so you know that in, within the capital campaign world, you're typically either needing to expand or improve upon your existing infrastructure. And everything that you do is about your mission and what you need to do to either better fulfill or more thoroughly fulfill that mission. 
First thing I want you to do when you're quantifying it is to take a look at what is driving the need for your expansion and or your improvement. So is it that um, that your community is is changing? And what I mean by that is um, maybe it's gotten bigger. Maybe all of a sudden uh, the 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 town that you're living in is growing considerably or um, there is an economic turndown, and you've got to, you know, for uh, for example, if you're a if you're a food bank, or if you are a thrift store, and you all all of a sudden need to be serving more clients, um, your service population has grown. We saw obviously a lot of this during COVID, uh, especially when people weren't working. And uh, one of the cool things that we saw one of our libraries do was. Um, their service population, they had to close down their library, but they, in working with the city, became actually a daycare center for all the additional daycare needs that were in their community. And then, of course, we've got the uh, the local, national, and the, the regional economy that might be driving um, driving your, your needs. So how do we quantify it? And, and, and we're doing that because we want to actually be able to go back and tell our donors, you know, this is why we're coming to you. So which route are you gonna take with regard to, um, with regard to your improvements? So are you going to expand existing infrastructure? And that, that is, you know, we've got, enough, we've got enough square footage, but what we really need to do is we need to remodel and improve and make things more efficient. Or perhaps uh, you've got enough land to, kick out a wall and and add on. Or maybe you've got enough land to build completely new infrastructure on it and then get rid of your get rid of your existing. Um, one of the things I also want you all to think about is when you're looking at building new, you've got either current location or maybe a new location. And if you're looking at a new location and if you're working with well, pretty much any nonprofit, you're going to have to look at your neighbors and see whether or not they're going to put up a fight to you putting your facility in there and, and just um, going to the neighborhood association and saying, hey, this is what we're thinking about doing and, and making sure that you're zoned correctly to go over there. The other thing I'd like for you all to think about is collaborating with other, with other nonprofit organizations. There are so many opportunities out there for us to put a couple of different organizations under the same umbrella to share infrastructure. And we see it a lot with YMCAs to where they're actually co-locating with housing projects and with, uh, with food banks. And if there is that type of opportunity, I, I'd really encourage you to take a look at it because donors love it. They absolutely love it when you all are trying to achieve economies of scale through collaboration with, with like-minded or at least complementary nonprofits in your area. In the end, it's really kind of a balancing act as to where are you going to go and what is your expansion going to look like. You've got the needs of your organization on the one side, and that is, are we going to be building new or renovating or, or simply expanding? And then on the other side, you've got your you've got your donor community and your service population. So how are we going to say by helping out, by expanding and improving on our existing infrastructure, this is how our service population and or our community is going to benefit. And once those two are in balance, then you're going to know, all right, we've got a we've got a we've quantified this and it looks good on both sides. We win and they win and therefore the donors are going to find it more appealing. Let's go back over to our agenda. Thanks. So now we're going to unpack what everything involves with the question, does your board support the project? So you've likely already heard that your board needs to be giving their time, talent, and treasure. Um, but when you're thinking about a capital campaign, their expectation should be that your board does an additional contribution of time, talent, and treasure to be moving this project forward to the best of their abilities. 
And we certainly want to be equitable in the way that we're approaching, particularly the treasure aspect. All we ever ask is that it's a personally significant gift for that board member. Another way you can think about this is framing it as you want that board member to feel like you are their favorite nonprofit. They're already volunteering their time to be with you and to move your mission forward. So hopefully their contribution to you in the financial sense is very complementary to the support that they're providing in the time and the tre treasure and the talent spaces as well. So again, they need to make sure that, and you need to make sure as an organization leader that you know that those individuals have agreed that they are ready to step up for this relatively short-term capital campaign that will ask an additional contribution of their time, of the talent and different special skill sets that they have that they're bringing to the organization to move it forward. And of course, the treasure specifically allocated for the capital project. So some of the factors that you want to be thinking about when you're looking at your board and thinking about the capital campaign of course, is their experience with the capital campaign. Experience certainly isn't required, but it's, it's very helpful to have if someone has done this before. So make sure you have an understanding of if this is something that your board has done, if they're comfortable doing it, or in most cases, we see that people really have never done this before, maybe not on the magnitude that you're looking at doing. So that's completely fine if you don't have a board that has any campaign experience, because hopefully you'll find some online resources or maybe even a consultant that's going to help you get the training that you need in order to be successful. So thinking about the campaign expectations, this could center around the timeline. How long is this going to take? It's not realistic unless you're a really successful, huge organization to raise several million dollars within six months. It just doesn't happen. So if you know that you have a $5 million capital project, you need to make sure your board has an understanding of what the expectations are for that. The timeline for that is probably closer to 18 to 24 plus months. So if you're clear on the expectations, that'll be a, a great baseline to set before you get into this capital project. And we also talked about campaign buy-in. Um, so Oh, sorry, a few more expectations before I forget. Their expectations also come down to who is going to be in charge of this. So are they expecting to just be able to sit back and watch you work your magic in order to do all of your fundraising before they need to really step in and get involved? Or do they expect and understand that they're going to need to support you, help open doors, um, maybe join you on solicitations if that's something they're comfortable with. So you need to really understand where they're coming from because otherwise you may find yourself steering a really big ship all by yourself. So make sure you know what they expect you to be able to accomplish on your own versus what you're hoping they're going to be able to help with. And then as we're thinking about the campaign buy-in, you need to, of course, understand that they all do agree that this is the right next step for your nonprofit. It's very easy for you to all be sitting in a room saying, yes, this capital campaign is the right next step. But then if you have the chance to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with that person, uh, you may learn that they're actually really apprehensive about this project, that they maybe don't think your organization has the capacity to do that. So in order to determine that campaign buy-in, we really always recommend having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with that individual whenever possible, preferably with an outside consultant that's going to be able to get their feedback from an unbiased view so that you can have a, a really strong understanding that the people that are on your board are truly on board with this project and are going to be able to help move this forward to the best of their ability. So that campaign buy-in goes not only from the emotional side, where they know that this campaign is the right next step, but also that same concept that I was just talking about, time, talent, and treasure, comes into play as well in the form of buy-in. So again, the experience is optional, wonderful to have, but certainly not required. Expectations are important conversations for you to have just to make sure that you and all of those board members are on the same page about who's going to be responsible for getting the work done. And we had a, a client in Tennessee where the board really was just sitting back and basically acted, acted as a rubber stamp, making sure that, yeah, the, the development director knows that we said yes to this, but they were pretty much just resting on their laurels, letting this development director 
hustle, hustle, hustle towards this campaign. And because the board wasn't willing to step up and they didn't have the understanding ahead of time that they should be stepping up, the campaign stalled out pretty quickly. And then of course, having the buy-in through both those one-on-one -on -one conversations to get the emotional buy-in, but also the understanding that these capital campaigns are significant events that don't happen very often. And because of that, this is the time, talent, and treasure commitment outside of what they're doing for your operating or your annual fund. So now Kevin's gonna walk us through the project. One more, one more thing going back there to internal internal support. Um, you can get a ton of really, really good feedback from your board members, both with the, you know, maybe they've got some experience. You've spelled out your expectations to them very clearly. They think it's a great idea. And as and as Carlin said with that example in Tennessee, uh, everyone was kind of doing everything correctly, but then looking at their executive director and or their CEO and saying, yeah, but she's really got this. Or, okay, but he's really got this. And one of the things that we're starting to do more and more is um, early on in the campaign planning process is testing the board a little bit because it's super easy to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then give them, give them a little something to do. And one of the really easy ways of doing that is, and, and maybe you're already doing this in your, in your board recruitment, but if you're getting ready to do a capital campaign, you're also gonna to have to do some, some campaign committee recruitment, and that is identifying potential leaders and donors to the campaign. And Carlin's gonna talk about this a lot more when we're, when we're looking at the um, feasibility study process. But, you know, saying, hey, you know, aren't you friends with, with Shirley? Yeah, uh, give, give her a call and tell her about this project. And I want to talk to her about a couple of things. Just a little itty bitty lift and, and see how they do. Um, and if you end up having to circle around and, and remind and remind and remind, and, and in fact, maybe even it never getting done, um, that's going to be a pretty good indication as to how well they're going to perform or not perform during a capital campaign. So we talked about benefit, quantifying your benefit. That's wrapping up the internal support. Now let's look at project costs. And this is, or, you know, it seems pretty straightforward, but you might be surprised at how many times we run into really big problems with, with costs. So First off, if you're gonna build new or acquire existing or you're refurbishing or anything, I don't want you to worry about that too much when you're going into your campaign planning side. We've done several projects where the nonprofit is like, we need to grow, we need about 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 square feet. We don't know if it's gonna be a build new, buy and renovate, expand. Uh, and sometimes we've had really super good success with just letting the donors decide. So we go into a feasibility study and the donors like, hey, they need to stay right where they are. Their location can't be beat or, you know what, I've got a piece of land over here and I can donate it or trade it or do something awesome. So don't worry too much about making your final decision on building or renovating or whatever, unless it's an absolute slam dunk. But if you've got some if you've got some questions out there and you're not quite sure what the best thing to do is, let your donors decide. All right, then I want you to realize that your budget is much, much more than just, you know, maybe you've got to buy the land and then you've got your construction costs, but you've got architectural fees, you've got consultant fees. If you're looking at a capital campaign, um, construction costs vary enormous amounts from region to region and from one month to another. Uh, maybe you're looking at doing a bond for part of your uh, part of your revenue for building new. Well, bonds are expensive to run. You've got you you've you've got a different line of consultants that are out there that help you prepare for and survey for and and market a bond too and and that's an additional cost. And then of course there's there's the FF and E, which is the um, furnishings, fixtures, and equipment. 
we're working on a on it's a pretty little project i think they're just looking at raising a a, a couple of million dollars and their ff and e is going to be in the quarter of a million dollars so that's you know roughly 10 percent of the total or more than 10 percent of the total so make sure that everything's in there so that you've got a a, a 360 degree overview of what all of your your costs are going to be and they've got to be current and i we say two years old here and any more man you sh you, you should try and be under a year old if you're working with anything over two years old it's not worthless but i promise you it's almost worthless so get update your bids make sure that you've got the zoning Correct. Remember, I was talking about your neighbors a little bit earlier. And then also, are you going to have any environmental assessments coming into you? Sometimes when you're buying a piece of land, you look at that land historically, and there have been some, you know, maybe it was an old gas station, and you're going to have to do a whole bunch of environmental assessments, and those are very costly. And then lastly, when we're looking at project costs, we need to think about cash flow. And oftentimes, Nonprofits don't really think enough steps in front of themselves as to when am I going to have the money on hand to pay for these fees that are going to be coming up. And when we look at our next slide, we see, and, and we'll show you, we'll give you a link to this. Uh, this is just a free resource of ours. But this is essentially a $10 million campaign. And the green stuff is is money coming in and the red is money going out. This is a $10 million capital campaign to where when we look at that first row, we figure we're gonna close about $6 million worth of solicitations in year one of the campaign and then $4 million in year two of the campaign. But then that next row down pledges, your pledges are gonna be spread out over whatever your pledge redemption period is. So in this example, it's five years. A lot of times nonprofits like to go shorter than that. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. But as you can see, that cash flow is spread out over an extended period of time. So that's your money coming in. And what we do on our spreadsheet is you just, you the only numbers that you stick in early on is how big is the campaign? So in this case, it's $10 million what is your pledge redemption period so in that case um, this case it's five it's five years so that's populated by the program the the solicitations and the pledges the green part is what you fill in so in this example the nonprofit had a million dollars worth of savings that's in that first column current and then they were expecting some uh some you know, bond revenue or or new market tax credits, or they had some other inflow that that was already sitting in their bank. The other thing that they knew was going to be an inflow, and remember, this is outside of your pledges, was at year four, they were going to be able to sell their current land. Okay, great. So they've got another $700,000 worth of income there. And there you see expected cash flow. Now, what happens is now we need to look at, 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 at the outflows and that red is what you fill in. What is your overhead going to be? So that means how much are you going to pay your campaign consultant and or your architect in order to just get you ready to build? And then the next row beneath that, that's your infrastructure costs and when those payments are coming due. And then finally, you've got that FF and E coming in where we're going to be buying and paying for all of our furnishings and our HVAC and et cetera. So in this instance, you see, and I don't see the whole the whole thing there, but um Carlin, is it does it show that we still hit a deficit at one of those points there? Because for some reason, yes, it does. Showing. Okay. So what this shows us is when when we are potentially going to be hitting a deficit. And the reason I, I think, and, and we encourage our clients and quite frankly, everybody to just kind of run through this and see where the problems might be. 
because a lot of nonprofits just don't have enough money sitting in the bank to cover the shortfall of paying all of these expenses again, because their pledges are spread out over so long. So this just gives you a really good idea of when you might hit a shortfall. And that allows you to start planning for that in advance so that you can get a bridge loan, or maybe you start asking your donors to, um, to uh, front load their pledges a little bit so that you can, so that you can avoid that. But Planning for it is the biggest part. And then, like I said, we've got a link to this. Uh, and I encourage any of you that are that are already looking at capital campaigns to go in there, play around with this a little bit and see if there are any shortfalls that you need to start planning for early on. Let's go back to our agenda. Thanks. So the next question that we're going to take a look at is, Determining if you need to do a professional feasibility study. So this is when you hire an outside consultant to lead your feasibility study, where you're getting feedback from your donors and your prospects about your project, about your nonprofit's image, about why they think this project matters, or maybe they think it doesn't matter. And then also hopefully getting some insight into the level of support that they would give to this project so that your consultant can then make a recommendation about your goal. So most of the time you do need to do a professional feasibility study. And that's not just me being biased because I do them. It's because you're more likely to get to your goal more efficiently if you do have outside counsel helping you with that feasibility study. But there's definitely some scenarios when you could lead this yourself. So we're gonna walk through each of those questions to see what that would mean. So the first question asks if you have a strong donor approved case for support. And the donor approved is the part of this that I really want to highlight because this means that you've gone out and asked for feedback from your donors and your potential prospects about the project that you're hoping to pursue. Um, you've really outlined what your need is. You've outlined what the consequences of not addressing that need. And you've outlined your plan for how you're going to go about it. So in this case for support, you are using a lot of language that's integral to your mission and to your vision. So if you have one of those that has already been tested with your donors and they've given you that feedback, and then you've incorporated it into the next draft of that case, then you're probably fine to maybe do a feasibility study on your own. So provided that you can also say yes to the next three questions. So in thinking about this case for support, to give you an example, we were working with a smaller community library. And we started their feasibility study before COVID and paused during COVID. And that gave them a chance to reevaluate some of their plans for the renovation project. And during that reevaluation, they thought, well, wow, what would happen if we put our library shelves on casters so that we can move them if we need to have more social distancing, um, if we're going to have bigger events and we want to have more space in this this room, why not be able to move these big library shelves? How cool would that be? And while that was certainly very exciting, the internal team was way more jazzed about it than the external team because there were so many other compelling pieces to this story. The children's book area that is going to have a pirate ship that was interactive and a maker's space that was going to have a 3D printer. There were so many other pieces that when they tested this case for support that had some pretty exciting language, as exciting as you can get about bookshelves, um, it didn't really resonate with the donor community. So in that case, this case for support was not donor approved, but we were able to get that feedback and refine the case for support in order to make it be donor approved. So the next question is if you have 100% board buy-in. So that goes back to the last topic that I was talking about. If you do have this deep understanding of their expectations, you know each board member's opinion about the timeline and the responsibilities that they would have to move it forward. And I saw a question come in that I'll address right now, actually. So this person was wondering about when the board is making a personally significant gift, if this gift has to be specifically for the capital campaign, or if it can count, if you can count the other more general gifts. We typically recommend that you know, part of board buy-in specifically for a capital project also has a financial component that is on top 
of that initial or their kind of standard operating or annual fund ask. So this board buy-in, as I'm talking about now, really is responsibilities related to their time, their talent, and their treasure just for the capital campaign on top of everything else that they're already doing for your board, for your organization. So I hope that answered the question. And particularly in light of this series of questions, if you don't have 100% board buy-in and you maybe haven't had those conversations, then perhaps you should consider hiring outside counsel to lead this feasibility study. But if you, as an organization, have had those one-on-one -on -one conversations and you can say for certain that all of your board knows their expectations, you're all working under the same timeline, you all understand who is responsible for which tasks, then maybe yes, you can do this feasibility study internally. So then the third question, and this is usually the one that makes you start to say, ah, oh, shoot, maybe I can't do this myself, is if you, your staff, and your board all have strong capital campaign experience. So in a perfect scenario for you to lead your own feasibility study, you will have all already done this before because you'll be working from the same center of operations, knowing all of the steps that need to happen in order to spearhead a successful, strong capital campaign. So if you don't all have that experience, or even if half of you don't have that experience, it would be our recommendation to pursue outside consulting to use uh, to lead this feasibility study for you. And then the last question asks if you have a strong, broad base of established major gift donors. And this means that you know that you have a wide group of people that have consistently been giving you 10,000, 25,000 plus, depending on how you define major gifts internally, that you know you can count on for capital campaign support. Even if you haven't already gone to them and had that conversation with them as part of a feasibility study, so, and thinking about an example that we had, we were working with a pretty prominent Catholic high school and they had a great group of major donors that have been giving to them for years. And they launched a pretty specific infrastructure project that was only going to support a couple of their athletics teams. And it was an Olympic sized swimming pool that they were looking to build. So while they had really strong athletic teams for that area, the major gift donors that they were counting on thinking that they would of course support this project because they would want to make it move forward and see it be successful actually chose not to because their areas of support were much more specific to their own giving preferences. In this case, it was things like scholarships um, and the crossover between scholarships and supporting a water polo team isn't very big. So in this scenario, they thought that they had this in the bag because they had so many people that have been giving five, six figure plus gifts throughout the years, but they hadn't had those conversations with them first. So they just assumed that that portion of donors was going to be ready to give to this campaign. So if you do have this broad base of donors that you know would support your specific project moving forward, then perhaps you don't need to do a feasibility study with a consultant. But if any of these questions gives you pause and you're not sure if you could answer them like with your whole heart, then it would be wise to likely consider doing an outside consultant to lead your feasibility study. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, your consultant is going to be giving you the honest feedback and they'll have no bias as they're creating this case for support based on that donor feedback that they received during their interviews. They'll also hopefully test your goal and be able to come back with a recommendation based on what they learned all of these individuals are going to commit to personally for this project. But I know if you're a newer nonprofit or you maybe don't have a big fundraising presence in your community, it's really hard to say absolutely to all of this, especially because you may have a smaller budget. But I mentioned it before and I'll say it again, the likelihood of you investing in a feasibility study done by an outside consultant, the likelihood of this getting you a greater ROI long-term in your capital campaign is really high because that consultant is going to get you to that goal even faster. And working with them on the front end to identify who your major gift donors are going to be is going to speed up your project and it's going to help improve your processes. So if you are going to do it yourself, I just have a couple like words of caution to think about. So one of these things is that 
your intended gift amounts may be less accurate when you're talking with those donors one-on-one, -on -one. especially if you're a smaller or startup nonprofit and you're talking to some donors that may be your friends of yours, they may be worried about letting you down. So they may reach for the moon and know that they will probably only get the stars, but they'll still give you something, but maybe, maybe not the full amount that they disclosed during that one-on-one -on -one interview. Kind of along those same lines, you may discover that these people, whether it's your staff or your board giving you the feedback about moving forward with a capital project, or your donors, whether it's, again, that same concept of moving forward with the campaign or what their gift amount might be, may be less honest with you if you're thinking that you're all kind of in a friend space. So we can also think about this like group think where you're less willing to raise your hand and say, I'm not really thinking that this is the best idea for us right now, if you're in a group, large group setting here. And the other piece is that you might have less credibility with some of the more established philanthropists in your community. If you have, I mean, if many of you are in the greater Omaha area, I'm sure there are the significant philanthropists that you always think of when you're thinking of those that give significantly to the bigger projects in your area. And those people are accustomed to having feasibility study interviews. They expect them. This is part of their job. They have these conversations sometimes as often as once a week. So if you skip that process and do it yourself, they may wonder if you really are taking this project seriously and if you're investing their money wisely to make sure that you, you will fully get that campaign goal. And again, for the third time, we, um, and this is the last time I'll bring it up, but if you do use professional consultants, you're more likely to hit your goal more quickly and more frequently as you're moving forward. So now if you do choose to hire an outside consulting firm, there's a couple different types and Kevin's going to unpack all of those now. Thanks, Carlin. Small firms, and, and I'm going to kind of keep this, you know, small versus big, where we probably fall a little bit more in the, in the mid- middle-ish thing, but let's look at the, the pluses and the minuses of working with small firms. Number one, uh, less expensive. And, and what does that mean? Well, um, your feasibility study within the Omaha market, I'm just going to make a guess, is probably ranging anywhere from 20000 to mid to upper $40,000 range. Uh, the smaller firms are going to be more like 20000 maybe even less than that. They're also going to have uh, more personable teams. You're you're going to be working with one person that is a jack of all trades. He or she will be doing your database research and your spreadsheet um, production and helping you with your copywriting and and all those things. And so, if they are truly um, skilled and and can do all that stuff fantastic. You're just going to have a, a wonderful relationship with him and her, him or her. Uh, usually though, however, they've got fewer upper level capabilities. Good example of that is database um, well screening and or database management and knowing how to do that correctly and or how to do some more prospecting for you. Those are pretty specialized services that smaller firms might have to sub out for, which I, what I mean by that is they're like, all right, I've got a person that's going to do that, but I'm going to have to charge you an extra thousand bucks to go out and do a wealth screening on these, you know, 500 donor prospects of yours. So small firms are great, especially on the personable side and they're in there and they might be a little bit less expensive, but you might end up having to pay for some extras and or not getting as high a level as of, of expertise from them as you can from, from a larger firm. So let's look at larger firms now. Obviously, more expensive. Uh, bigger teams, that can be sometimes a plus and sometimes a minus. Uh, if you are, for example, you love your lead consultant, your primary contact person, but then they hand you off to a uh, to a data analyst who you're like, oh my God, this person is just killing me. They're so boring. Um, yeah, that's just going to be the way that it is. And and you might be getting a higher level of professional, I'm sorry, of expertise 
but it comes at the price of maybe not having the same level of relationship with them. And then finally, more capabilities. And this just comes back to what I was telling you before, and that is bigger firms have the ability to take on more overhead. For example, uh, we, we invest in a really, really cool wealth screening service called iWave. Um, it's not cheap but we feel it's necessary and gratefully we're big enough to where we can absorb that extra um, that extra overhead so we can provide that service quote unquote free to our clients without having to charge them without having to charge them so just here's a good visual for you all when thinking about thinking about hiring uh, small versus big I want a taco. I know I expressly want a taco, and that's what that that's my jam right now. I'm going to go to the taco truck now. If I want a drink, okay, I'm going to have to pay a little bit extra. If I want some guacamole with it, if I want some pico de gallo with it, um, all of those are going to be a little bit more. So I pay for the tacos, and then I'm paying for all of the other things that I may or may not want. That's one option. The other is I want every single type of Mexican food, American food, Indian food, Italian food. I'm going to go to a buffet where I just give them my, my 40 bucks and the world is my oyster. I'm going to go around and eat as much of whatever is out there and it's going to cost me one price. So kind of visualize it that way. How, how specialized do you want to get? How many extras do you want to pay for? Or do you want your consulting firm to be able to take care of, of everything? And, and the best way to go about this, and unless you really, really already have a relationship with a consultant or you kind of know what you already want, um, specifically because you've worked with them before, is to do a request for proposal process. And this is when you send out... Uh, and, and I'll talk about what's in there in just a second, but you, you send out the RFP to uh, several consulting firms, maybe five, six, or seven. If you don't really know where to start, you've got a great resource just right here um, with, with, your, with your fellow nonprofits. Talk to them and say, hey, who did you use? You can also look at the Association of Fundraising Professionals and say, can you recommend some, um, some nonprofits for us? So please take your time. You also need to sell your vision. What is that? What does that mean? You, your organization has, through all of the previous steps that Carla and I have gone through with you, you're, you've got an idea of what you're doing and why, and you've got internal support. So in your RFP, you say, all right, here's who we are and what we do. That's your project background. Now you got your project description. Here's, here's how we're going to improve our services in this time frame, and then here's what we want to learn specifically from the fundraisers. How much time is it going to take to do a feasibility study? How many consultants are we going to be working with? Are you doing confidential or or or, or open interviews? Um, all of these things need to be asked when you're doing your pitch, and then you give them a deadline and say, "All right, answer all of these questions and give us your responses by this time." You're gonna probably wanna form a small committee of your board members and staff to review the submittals. And then within your timeline, you should absolutely not hesitate for a second to saying to your consultants, hey, we're gonna ask a couple of you to come out and talk to us in person. And please don't, please don't do this over Zoom. I mean, this is a big, this is a big decision that you're making. And I love Zoom. Obviously, we're doing these, these virtuals all the time, but you all aren't hiring us to, and you're not spending, you know, 20, 30, 50, hundred thousand dollars on us. But when you are, you wanna you wanna be closer to them, you wanna read them, you wanna get a feel for who they are, and you wanna spend like an hour or so just giving them, asking them questions and getting a good feel for their chemistry with you. So invite the top two or three firms to come and uh, and present to you. None of them should make you pay to do that. 
And it is completely, if you're like raising $2 million or more, it's something that we really want you to consider doing because we want you to choose wisely. We want you to get the firm that is best set for you all. And again, that that picture that picture on the on that on the right there, you don't want that awkward blind date where you have no idea when they come in and they start and they start working with you uh, what they're really like. So we're going to take our time. We're going to get references. We're going to we're going to throw out our RFPs and ask people to get back to us. We're going to beware of consultants that that hurt like they feel like they're part time. And that's just going to be a gut instinct. It's really easy to sell yourself as, oh, I do this and I've got 50 clients and blah, blah, blah. Well, a lot of times people hang up consulting shingles just because they're in between jobs and, and, and or um, they're they're half hearted about it. Uh, your budget. Consulting budget. Uh, there is no real good way to um, know how much you should be spending on both your feasibility study and your campaign. So your campaign planning and your campaign management. You're in the you know two to five million dollar range. You should be looking to spend less than ten percent on all of your consulting fees. If you're in that range, then you're you're safe. Uh, if you've got a, a a campaign that's 10 million, 20 million, 30 million, you know, you're going to be looking at less than 5%. So this is for your campaign planning and for your, your campaign, <clears throat> excuse me, management. Harlan has said this several times, one more. And again, this is, this is just, it's proven a good consultant's going to get you to your goal faster, period. And then finally, don't worry about, and, and we, we get this a lot, especially in RFPs, you know, how many millions of dollars have you raised in Omaha, Nebraska? All right, and, and I'm sure Omaha's got fantastic consultants, but your mission, your vision, that's what's going to be moving you towards hitting your goal and your board participation. Your consultant might know a gajillion donors in the Omaha area or throughout Nebraska, but you know what? They're not signing the pledge form. It's you that's got to sell your vision. So I want you to make sure that you're working with a consultant that you're comfortable with, regardless of how much exact experience they've got with a, let's say, uh, uh, emergency department expansion, regardless of how much they've got, the experience they've got in Omaha. Because folks, every project that, that Carlin and I do and the rest of our team is, is completely unique. Every board, completely unique. Every CEO and executive director, completely unique. All of this is completely wonderful and beautiful and standalone. But the fundraising process is the fundraising process. It is not individualized for every single campaign. It's a proven process. We didn't make it up. We abide by it. And it, it includes you all going out there and engaging and selling the vision. So primary, make sure you're working with people that you trust, who are energetic, who you who you who you enjoy, and of course, consultants sometimes they can be a pain in the in the neck. Yes, I get it, but they're leading you down the right and down the right path, and you value you value their input, et cetera. All right, enough of that. Let's go back to our agenda. <laughs> I'll be efficient with this one so that we've got time for questions. Since I know we're pushing pushing the end here, so. When we know when to start is, first of all, your family needs to be on board 100%. So that means we've got your board members, we've got your staff members, everyone is in agreement that the campaign is the right next step and you're ready to move forward. Uh, so depending on the size of your project, let's think about backing into this. So a feasibility study 
typically takes three to five months. And honestly, after COVID, we've been seeing it take closer to four to six months, just because I think people are moving at a slightly more leisurely pace these days, which is all a very good thing. So maybe anywhere from three to six months for your study. And then depending on the size of your campaign, expect at least 10 to 24 months. And Kevin touched on the pledge redemption period earlier. This could be three years, it could be five years, kind of just depends on what your cash flow needs are and what your donors needs are in order to like make a gift that's comfortable for them and for their budget. So you'll have to decide that internally, but it's perhaps three to five years for your pledge redemption. And again, depending on the size of your project, maybe you're doing a renovation that's only going to take a couple months, or maybe you're doing a full-on construction that might take anywhere from one to two years. So if it's helpful for you to visualize this, particularly if you have some external factors that are going on and or that are going to impact your nonprofit's ability to move forward, might be helpful for you to make some sort of visual here where you've broken it down into quarters and years so that you're able to really pace out when you need to be finished and then backing into it from there, knowing when you need to get started. So if we're thinking about the roadblocks that might happen, one of the biggest ones that we see is when there's a stall between when your feasibility study or your campaign planning study wraps up and when your campaign actually starts. The reality is those feasibility studies have a shelf life of six to 12 months max. So the sooner you can go straight from the study into the actual campaign, the better, because that way your project is still likely more realistic. Your donors are still aware of the project. Their feedback about the amount that they might give is probably even more realistic uh, six months down the road than it would be if you were to start two years after the feasibility study ended. So reduce the number of months in between the conclusion of your study and your campaign actually starting as best you can. If you do have any changes in leadership, maybe that's at the executive level position, maybe it's your board president, and perhaps that changes the vision for the project or maybe even the willingness to do the project entirely, certainly would be a roadblock. So I hope that that isn't something that you would experience. Coming back to Kevin's conversation earlier about the budget, if, if you were needing to do some value engineering because you were just unrealistic in, in what you thought this was going to cost, then you may find yourself in a position where you're having to take some extra time to figure out how you can actually fund this with the money that's coming in since maybe your construction costs changed. And if you are working with other partners in making this vision possible, that is very cool. And we love to see that. And donors love to see that, like Kevin talked about earlier. But it takes time to build that relationship. And if you're in a smaller community and you know that you and those other nonprofit partners are likely going to the same donors for support, you may need to work together to figure out how you're going to coordinate all of those asks and what that looks like so that it looks like your left hand is talking to the right. And then the last piece here is not making enough asks. And we can see this be twofold where anyone could say, gosh, if only we could get in touch with Oprah or if only we could get in touch with Mackenzie Scott then we wouldn't even have to do this campaign. They could just make this happen. But the reality of that actually happening is pretty slim. So either relying on one person, hoping that they're really going to move the needle quickly for your project, or on the flip side, you hear this all the time where you say, gosh, if we could just get a thousand people to give us a thousand dollars, wouldn't that make things so easy? And yes, it would, but it still would be pretty hard to find a thousand people to give you a thousand dollars for a project. So make sure that you're following that major gift process and making enough asks that are spread out across your gift pyramid from those really high six, seven figure plus gifts all the way down through your four or five plus figure gifts that are towards the bottom of that gift pyramid as you're going through your different capital campaign phases. So to recap with a couple minutes left here, we explored making sure that you know these six questions to ask yourself before you do launch a capital campaign. So the first one is that you need to be able to define the quantifiable benefit to expanding or improving your infrastructure. You also need to know for certain that your board supports the project. You also need to have current and realistic project costs. And of course, need to decide if you need to do a professional feasibility study or not. And if you do, you need to know what kind of consulting firm you want to hire. And then you also need to think about your timeline. So with just a couple minutes left, we would love to answer any additional questions. Um, I think you're welcome to raise your hand and unmute yourself if you'd like, or you can type it into the chat.